bokeh, that mystical, magical, photographical phenomenon. When we first encounter our very own photo that has it, we marvel at it. As photographers, we spend thousands of dollars just for a little bit more of it. And as software developers, we spend bajillions to try to simulate it. But in the midst of all of this, do we forget that bokeh is just background? Today, my friends, we're gonna bust this bokeh thing wide open. We're gonna get to the heart of how much bokeh really matters in our photography. And to do this, we're gonna use some science, or at least as much science as I can come up with. We're gonna use terms like quantitative research, confounding variables, and most importantly, a survey. To be more specific, what I wanted to find out was at what point an average non-photographer person with functioning eyeballs can tell the difference or has an opinion on which is better between photos where the biggest variant is a difference in aperture. To do this, I went out and I took a bunch of photos in different circumstances with different subjects and having different apertures. Although I needed different subjects and scenes, I wanted to try to have at least some consistency in the quality of the bokeh. So to that end, I tried to keep the subject four feet away from the camera and the background six feet behind the subject. Then with all of these photos, I chose a pair from each scene. The first shot of each pair was shot wide open at f1.2 on an APS-C Fuji device with a 56mm 1.2 lens. And the second was pulled from one of the major stop aperture shots between f1.4 and f8. Next, since I didn't want my participants catching onto the purpose of what I was studying and start to fixate on the background, I put together a bunch of other pairs of photos that are similar to each other but for different reasons. Some were identical but shot on different film stocks or with different lenses, some were composed like different. Sometimes the expression changed. You get the idea. Then I built a survey where the pairs of different aperture photos were spaced out in order of increasingly different aperture ranges, but at random intervals between these distracting photos. For each pair of photos, I asked the participants which of the two was better and why. I didn't qualify what better meant. I left it completely open-ended. I then showed these photos to 52 average non-photography people with functioning eyeballs. And that's basically it. After I got the data back, I was interested in two things. First, from the raw numbers, who preferred which apertures, or more precisely, at which point in the differences between apertures did people start to have strong opinions on which photo was better. The second thing I wanted to know is at what point did people start using terms related to bokeh in their reasoning. Obviously there are always going to be tiny tiny differences between photos, especially those photos I did of people or pets, but I felt that was okay as long as they were pretty darn close because I wanted to see at what point the differences in the background were more obvious to people than any perceived micro differences in the subject. In short, at which aperture difference did people use terms like blur or out of focus when referring specifically to the background? Now, before I share you the results, I want to say for all of you who are educated in good research practices, you will find that there are definitely flaws in my study. For those of you who are interested in that, the things that I would do if I were to do it again or if I were to do it the right way, please refer to my notes in the video description before leaving me any nasty comments. Take this stuff as anecdotal or for entertainment purposes mostly, or log it away in the category of present some interesting questions which were Warrant further or more scientific exploration. But other than that, I'm not going to make any claims that this research represents some sort of immutable truth. At best, what it does do is serve to question some assumptions that I see floating out there, which I think are not healthy. But now that you've been properly disclaimed, on to the results. At a delta of 1.2 to 1.4, I recognize that this is not a full stop difference, but I felt like it was a good starting point to start to see if folks can discern a bokeh difference. Although no one mentioned any difference in the background, in these first pair of images, five people did recognize differences in the sharpness of the face, and 29 people preferred the 1.4 over the 14 who preferred the 1.2. That left 10 people undecided. The photo of the dog was less decisive with an exact 50-50 split of folks who liked the 1.2 versus the 1.4, but the majority of people, a cool 30, either could not tell the difference or had no preference. As we move to a difference between 1.2 and f2, people start to notice subtle differences in the background. To be precise, 4 out of 52 mentioned a difference in the background blur. But interestingly, there was a strong bias towards the f2 version of the photo with people using phrases like the picture has more details, or although on both images the background is blurred, I still like the the fact that on A you can see the textures in the shrubs in the back. Another person said the background is clear and not so fuzzed out, which makes it easier to look at the whole picture. You get the idea. Only 5 participants felt that the 1.2 is more pleasing, leaving 22 without preference. 
With my second set of images at a difference of 1.2 and f2, although several noticed the difference in sharpness or clarity of the subjects, only one participant actually talked about the blurring of the background. Although one participant stated that the 1.2 image had less flyaway hairs. Either way, once again, more people preferred the f2 version, but the majority of participants, 26 of them, either couldn't tell a difference or had no preference. At a difference of 1.2 and 2.8, we see some larger numbers of folks start to pick up on differences in the background blurring. Prior to this set, they would use terms like clearer, brighter, color, sharper, accurate, crisp, more realistic, or focused to describe the differences in images, but very few specifically mentioned the background. But here we find 12 people mentioning it. But interestingly, although people started to notice the difference, it's still fairly split between those who preferred the background blurring and those who did not. And then we get to my crystal ball shot, which I realize I may have fudged a bit on the six feet behind the subject thing. Sure, the tree was about six feet, but a bunch of the roots were not. So yeah, again, this is not a perfect study, but either way, we really see the numbers skew toward the F2 version of this image, with only six preferring the wide open shot. At F4 to 1.2, things get interesting. The differences are now extremely stark to participants, but on in this shot, only three people prefer the shot of the flower at 1.2. Conversely, in this composition, while not a landslide like the previous shot, the majority of people preferred the pleasant isolation that the 1.2 gave the hat against the background over the F4. Here again, at a difference of 5.6 and 1.2, the vast majority of people preferred the 5.6 version. This one, frankly, really surprised me, but most people preferred having detail in the bushes behind the dog. They said things like, the picture has more details, or I can see the background clearer, or the background is less blurry. Our second 5.6 versus 1.2 photo pair was less decisive, with another near 50-50 split between those who preferred more background context and those who did not. In this photo pair, the F8 version was preferred by the majority, owing to the greater context it provided. And in our last photo, things swung in favor of the F8 version, again, for that greater context it provided. So that's the information. You can draw your own conclusions, of course, but in case you're interested, here are three takeaways that I came away with. And the first hopefully shouldn't be too surprising to more experienced photographers, but it may come as a major shock to younger photographers, especially younger photographers who learn photography on YouTube, where bokeh seems to have been put on a pedestal. But lesson number one is that the strength of a photograph is not measured in terms of background blur. Please consider that there are many, many ways to create separation between the subject and the background. The creative use of lighting, leading lines, framing, and contrast, all of these things can be important, if not more important, in creating a striking composition. And oftentimes the background needs to be in focus to provide the context of the story being told. In short, don't be lazy. It's easy to blur the background into oblivion. What's harder is to think through the full composition and consider all the possible elements that will complement and set your photo apart from all the other photographers who shoot wide open all the time. In addition, with computational photography really starting to take off, you're gonna see more and more smartphone photography with simulated bokeh and simulated off-camera lighting. Whether computational photography will ever adequately substitute for better equipment and better techniques remains to be seen, but if it does, it will be your ability to compose an artistic scene with or without bokeh that will separate you from the average Joe with an iPhone. Lesson number two is that the average person cannot really tell a difference between photos taken at a difference of a couple aperture stops, even when they are specifically looking for differences. If you really just have to have some blurred out separation between your subject and your background, you don't need an ultra fast expensive prime to achieve that. In fact, if anything, the results of this study seem to suggest that people might prefer a little bit more definition that maybe an f2.8 or an f4 aperture might provide, at least at the distances I tested here. I knew it was a distinct possibility that a good portion of participants would prefer larger apertures, but I honestly was surprised at what a landslide difference there was. Some may argue that maybe I should have compared at a higher base aperture maybe instead of wide open at 1.2 I should have started at f2 and gone up from there maybe but what this did was remind us that for most subjects at distances not too far away from us which is is very common in portraiture for instance that there's not really a need or a case for the amount of depth of field that so many portrait photographers say you have to have a full-frame camera and an 85 millimeter 1.2 lens to achieve but the third lesson is more subtle. The data seems to suggest that people notice differences in sharpness of the subject before they notice the differences in the blurriness in the background. Of course, experienced photographers understand that depth of field should be used responsibly, but I think it's a powerful reminder to us that most people probably perceive sharpness of the subject more readily than they do the pleasant creaminess happening back here somewhere. As photographers, I think this is a crucial lesson. We should be ultra concerned about protecting the sharpness of a subject from front to back. Bokeh can be helpful at times, but in most cases, it is not more important than having sharp, crisp, clear subject. 
In short, keep your priorities straight. What is in focus is always more important than what is not in focus. So before you run out and spend your child's college fund on a full frame camera and thousands of dollars worth of fast aperture prime lenses, consider why you need them. If it's because you want more bokeh, well, that might not lead to the best results. If you're going to stick that $2,000 prime lens on your full frame camera and super glue the aperture dial to f1.2, I think the only person you're gonna be impressing is you. Don't let the reason you're moving to a more expensive kit be because you need that status symbol. It will cost a lot. It will be much more gear. You're going to be less likely to lug around and have with you at the times where it will matter most. And most importantly, it will not magically make you a better photographer. If you upgrade, do it for the right reasons. And those more valid reasons in my mind, I would say are for shooting in really low light situations where having lower ISOs might actually be more important than having completely tack sharp subjects front to back. So for instance, at sporting events or shooting in low light at weddings. Additionally, wider apertures can be very helpful in separating subjects which are further away from you as shooting wide open in those situations may not compromise the sharpness of the subject from front to back like it would if your subject is four feet in front of you four feet, four feet in front of you. So that's worth considering. Now, there may be other reasons, more artistic reasons, for instance, where you cannot compromise on lens speed. And I don't wanna make anyone feel bad who does photography for themselves and only for themselves and are personally much more satisfied with backgrounds that have been completely obliterated. If that's your thing and that makes you happy, then please don't let me and my survey get in your way. You do you. But that's all for now, guys. Be sure to hit the comment section if you've been personally offended by anything I said. But for everybody else, make sure you subscribe as in my next video, we'll be studying something I've been wondering about since I first picked up a camera and heard my first photography lesson, and that is the rule of thirds. But until then, remember, kindness before cameras. We'll talk to you again real soon.